Well, hello there, Catalyst Church. My name's Chris. I'm the lead pastor here at Catalyst, and I'm so excited to be able to host for you guys Catalyst Church online today. Today is Palm Sunday. We're one week out from Easter, and man, we are so excited about all the great things that God is doing here at Catalyst Church, both online and in our live services. And uh, so I just want to extend a special welcome to all of you, and thank you for tuning in with us this week. If you're new with us, we would love to have an opportunity to connect with you, and the best way for you to let us know that you're watching today is to simply grab your phone and text Catalyst SP to 97000. And when you do that, you'll get a digital connect card link uh, texted back to you. And then uh, from there, you can let us know that you're watching with us today. You can also submit prayer requests or if there's anything else that we can do to serve you and your family, that is the best way for you to let us know uh, how we can best serve you. Also, for those of you that are regular uh, attenders online with us, please use that uh, text to connect, to communicate with us anything that you need from us, whether it be prayer, if you want to get involved in a group, if you want to start serving in some capacity, that is your way of connecting with us. So please, for all of your community needs, use that Catalyst SP to 97000 text, and uh, we'd love to be able to connect with you. Like I said, guys, we are one week out from Easter, and we are so excited to be able to start gathering once again after as a church, um, you know, as you know, last year, uh, Easter 2020 was super weird. Uh, we, everything was shut down. We could not gather in person. And so everything with Easter last year was online. Well, we are so excited uh, to be able to let everyone know that we will be gathering in person uh, for a couple of really amazing things coming up this week. The first one, is our Good Friday services. Uh, coming up this Friday, uh, we will be hosting two in-person services here in our building at 5.30 and 7 p.m. Now, seats are limited for that, and so we're asking everyone to please register ahead of time uh, to reserve your seat. You can do that on the Catalyst Church app. Um, go onto the events tab, and you'll be able to see uh, how you can register for that service as well. But that's gonna be our time to get our hearts ready, uh, really, for Easter as we remember the the death um, and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ on Friday. And then of course, guys, we know that Good Friday is not the end of the story. Sunday is really where we'll be celebrating the, uh, the end of the story on Easter Sunday morning. And like I said, last year we were all online, but this year we are so excited that we get to host one gigantic outdoor service so that everyone can come. If you know, For those that don't feel comfortable coming into a building yet, we're doing it outside. It's going to be Sunday, April 4th at 10 a.m. at Ebel Park here in Santa Paula. We're going to have live music, a message of hope. It'll be a great time for us as a community just to gather and celebrate Easter together in the beautiful sunshine of Ebel Park. And for those of you families, we are going to have a free Easter egg hunt for all children immediately after the service in the park. Your kids are going to love it. Man, kids have been stuck inside, not being able to have as much fun. And so we are really, really uh, overjoyed to be able to host an Easter egg hunt for something fun for the kids. So that's what's happening with Easter, guys. Please spread the word share the social media post, grab one of the invite cards on a Sunday morning and spread the word about Easter. We want as many people to come to the park on that morning so that we can tell as many people as possible about the good news of Jesus Christ. We have a couple other things that are coming up here at the church we want to let you know about. One of them is we are going to be offering baptisms here in our main sanctuary on Sunday, April 18th. We have been a long time since we have been able to have baptisms and celebrate those here as a church family in our building. And so on Sunday the 18th, we are excited to be able to offer to anyone who's interested in being baptized that opportunity. For those of you that don't know what baptism is, Baptism is an ancient practice that's been done, being done by Christians for over 2,000 years where that is their opportunity to make an outward expression of the inward salvation that they have received. And so baptism is your way to show your friends and family and your church um, that you have surrendered your life to Christ and you want to follow him as best as you can. And so if you want more information about baptism, please let us know on the Digital Connect card. And on the app, you can also register for one of two baptism classes. We're going to be having baptism classes on Zoom on both Monday, April 5th and Monday, April 12th. And so if you go onto the app, you can register for one of those baptism Zoom classes. We'd love to be able to meet with you, answer questions, tell you what baptism is all about, and get you scheduled for the 18th. We are also... 
really excited about coming into our spring season of C groups. And we uh, have a lot of different options that we have in front of us as groups. We're going to be having C groups. We have our overcomers group that meets here on Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock. But we also are excited that we're going to be able to have a rooted group as well as offering financial peace this spring. And uh, Pastor Jason did an interview around his table of a couple of couples um, who have personally benefited from two of the group options that we're going to be offering to you. And so your community snapshot this week is about that. So go ahead and take a, watch, take a look at this video. Hey guys, for this week's uh, Community Snapshot, we got a couple of my favorite people here. We got Michael and Kelly Mora, we got Martin and Christina Lee. The reason that I wanted you to hear from them this week is because uh, Mike and Kelly Mora have gone through Rooted, which we're getting ready to offer, and Martin and Christina have gone through Financial Peace University, which we're also gonna offer really quick here um, for all of you guys that are interested. So I guess my first question for you guys is, when you show up for Rooted, when you show up for, for FPU, what, what would somebody expect? What, what is the format? What does it look like um, when you guys attend and, and the stuff that you guys cover? Well, um, with Rooted, we would meet once a week with our group. We just um, would meet on a weekly basis. We had our study that we would go through during the week and then we'd all kind of meet together and kind of go Discuss. over what we learned um, and um, yeah. F FPU, what, what do you think somebody should expect when they do FPU? So FPU is also like a classroom setting. Um, it's with couples, singles, old, young, and there's a workbook that goes along with the DVD that you watch. Um, you have discussion in class and you have homework that is going to help you gain financial peace. Sweet. So the whole idea behind Financial Peace University is like getting control of your finances using yes. like biblical concepts, oh, right? Yeah. yeah definitely. Um, point of rooted is like to get really rooted and grounded in your faith, right? Okay. Yeah. Ten weeks, nine weeks. So as you guys went through the program, and there's a lot, a lot of different like creative elements to both of those. Mm -hmm. um, what was maybe an immediate impact you guys just saw? You guys saw in your lives, um, and has there been any like lasting impact to being in rooted and being in FPU? When FPU came up before we went, we literally had no money. We couldn't even afford the class, and one of our friends paid for it. So that was the immediate, is that we realized how far into debt we were and how bad we were with money. The lasting would definitely be the, one of the, the concepts is to be able to give back to people, and that's definitely been something lasting. Um, just this week alone, we were able to pay for Christina's cousin's car repairs. Um, so that's definitely a lasting effect, is being able to give back to people and take care of the people in need. Now we can talk about money and not actually have arguments about, you know, $100 here or $50 there. We actually can sit down and say, this is gonna cost this much, what should we do? Cool. So that's definitely been a big lasting effect. Cool, so helps you drive down debt, yep. helps you establish budget, oh, yeah. tips on how to stay in budget. Oh, yeah. yeah, okay, Yeah. way cool. Rooted, well, any impact, any lasting impacts? Yeah. Um, for me, I um, actually wasn't excited at first to do Rooted. We kind of decided it was probably something we needed to do. And um, I think throughout the process, I think kind of immediately and, and over the long term, I, I learned to kind of just trust God more. Just kind of like I don't have to have all the answers. God's there to, to um, provide for us and kind of be on this journey. Yeah. I think uh, the other thing for me is it, it really strips everything down and you, you, it brings you back to the beginning and really builds up your faith again and really establishes that relationship between you and God and kind of kickstart our, that our faith back up again in a way and just uh, kind of keep that going in our marriage. So it's beneficial for somebody who may be new to the faith or somebody that was in your position you guys did 
already had a relationship with the Lord and kind of just, like you said, kind of kicked it back into gear for you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, for both of you guys, for FPU, for Rooted, if somebody like your best friends came up to you and said, Martin and Christina, we're kind of thinking about FPU. Why do you think we should do it? You know, Michael and Kelly, we're kind of thinking about Rooted. Why do you think we should do it? What would you tell anybody that came up to you? What encouragement would you give them for doing the, the classes that you guys did? Um, I think that, like Martin said, it's opened up a lot of conversation. And we have talked to friends about it and realized just how many people do struggle financially. It really helps you to be disciplined. And um, at the end of the day, it's been a blessing for us to be able to bless others. We're really thankful for that friend that stepped up and just said, hey, I'm going to cover this class for you um, because it was a blessing in my life and I want it to be in yours too. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's anybody, anyone and everyone. <laughs> anyone and everyone. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. Cool. What would you guys tell to somebody on the fence about Rooted? <clears throat> I think if you're even just a little curious about... Um, trying to expand your faith or um, reestablishing or even establishing a relationship with Christ. Rooted is a great, um, a great study and great this group that you can be a part of to help guide you to where you kind of want to, want to be or where you're trying to be. Mm -hmm. so. And I, I think even, even if not for that, for the community alone. Mm -hmm. I mean. Yeah. I remember somebody said, by going through Rooted, they went from saying hi to each other on the patio to hugging each other yeah. on the patio. Yeah. You know, you just yeah. build these really cool connections. Um, so if you guys are interested in it, I highly recommend it. If you see Martin and Christine or Michael Kelly around, ask them questions about it. I'm sure they would be happy to talk to you about it. They all start the week of April 19th. You can sign up for them on the app. There are costs involved. FPU is a $60. Um, registration that's either for an individual or a couple that gives you access to all the different online um, tools and resources um, for FPU. Uh, Rooted is $25 per person. That's for your book, your study book you get, uh, materials, and then we have a celebration dinner at the end to kind of honor and remember what God did over those 10 weeks together. So hope you guys are interested. Talk to me too if you want more information. Mora's, Lee's, thanks for hanging out. Enjoy your pizza. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. <laughs> Man, that was some great uh, testimonies of real life change that has come out of both Rooted and Financial Peace University. So thank you guys for sharing your story with us. As you can see, these types of groups make a difference in people's lives. And so we want to give you all the details that you need to know about our spring season of groups. The first one is all about C groups. So our C groups are our uh, midweek times of connection and growth for people. And so if you'd like to get connected with others in a C group, they meet for Bible Bible study, prayer, and uh, community with one another. They meet on various nights throughout the week in the area. Some of them are on Zoom still, and some of them are in person. You can get all uh, the entire list of all of our C groups on the Catalyst Church app, and I want to encourage you guys to register for one of those soon as registration is open. The other two groups we have are one is Financial Peace University that is a video series that will be hosted by myself and my wife Sierra here on Monday nights at 7 o'clock here at the church. Um, for those of you that uh, need some help with finances, with budgeting, getting out of debt, saving for the future, and trying to figure out how money will not manage your life, but that you can manage and steward your money God's way. Financial peace is for you. That's going to be on Monday nights here at the church. There is a fee involved with it, or a cost, I should say, and you can register for financial peace uh, by going to the events tab on the app, and all the information for how to register is there. We are also really excited to help those of you that want to reconnect in your faith to join a rooted group. Pastor Jason and his wife Amy are going to be hosting rooted groups at their house on Tuesday nights here uh, coming soon. And so rooted is really an exper uh, experience that you go through with a small group of people to help you understand um, how to connect with God, how to have a relationship with Jesus, how to live a spirit-filled life, um, how to pray. It's a fantastic 10-week uh, uh, opportunity. And so if you've never done Rooted, I want to highly encourage you to go through it, especially if you're new to Catalyst. It's a great way to connect with others who are also new here at the church. And again, you can register for Rooted 
on the events tab on the Catalyst Church app. Um, I also forgot one thing earlier that I want to announce before I pray and hand this off to Pastor Trevor for today's message is the week after Easter, Catalyst Church is going to be going to three Sunday morning services. So our times are changing because we're adding another service because we want as many people to be able to come to church on Sundays as possible. So our new service times are 8.15, 9.30, and 11 o'clock. And registration is still required for all of those services. And registration goes live every Every single Wednesday for the upcoming Sunday. And so please uh, note that change, start to pick out which service you're going to attend, and we hope to see you again in the weeks following Easter. Well, hey guys, we are continuing in our preaching series called Vantage Point, where we're looking at different vantage points that people around the crucifixion had um, around Jesus as we anticipate Easter. And Pastor Trevor, our youth pastor, uh, is going to be delivering today's message. Really looking forward to what he has to share. So I'm going to pray for the message and then I'm going to hand it off to Trev. So will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, all that we're anticipating in the coming week. For the work that you uh, did in your ministry during this week represents so much and, and so many important things in our walks with you. We thank you that uh, this week you go to the cross and you die for our sins. And then on Easter Sunday morning, you rise from the dead, proving that sin and Satan and death have no power over the power of God. And so God, we thank you for all that you're doing in us. We thank you for our church. And we wanna just thank you for the work that you're gonna do in each one of us through Pastor Trevor's message today, Lord. So we commit ourselves to you. Ask Holy Spirit that you would do a work through all of us. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm gonna hand it off to Pastor Trev. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Hey, so while Chris is doing announcements, I just checked real quick to, um, to see what the age uh, limit was on the Easter egg hunt, and it turns out 41 and a half, and so I'm just in there. Um, I can't wait. No, I'm just kidding, obviously, but uh, I always love the big kids at the Easter egg hunt, like sprinting for the eggs as the little kids. That just cracks me up. Um, so the Easter egg hunt of the park is going to be great, but yeah, as Chris said, welcome in to Cattle's Church Online, and uh, yeah, we're going to be moving to part two here of this sermon series, Vantage Point, and, uh, and for anyone who's ever wondered um, if they can make a difference, for anyone who's ever felt like uh, perhaps you, um, because of decisions you've made, um, because of the lack of skills that you might feel like you have or whatever, you've wondered, can you make a difference? You know, maybe you feel like you're too old to make a difference in the kingdom of God. Maybe you feel like you're too young to make a difference in the kingdom of God. Maybe you've made too many mistakes. Maybe you just, the, just the, the story of your life is one that you've always felt like, how could God possibly use me? And I just want to share with you um, that I think the, the passages we're going to look at this morning uh, or whenever you're watching online, um, these passages have the ability to, to just encourage us in a remarkable way that oftentimes the people that uh, the world might consider insignificant uh, are often the most significant in the kingdom of God. And so I'm really encouraged to share with you. And so we're going to be talking about uh, the story of Easter through the vantage point of Mary Magdalene and the other women who were at the cross. And there, as we, what we know about Mary uh, just from the text is that at some point Mary was, was a woman who had seven demons within her. Seven is often a number of completion in the Bible. Perhaps it was literally seven demons, or perhaps this is an example to say Mary was very demon-possessed. Mary was also obviously a woman, and women in this time in, in ancient Rome were not, um, were not on, on par with men. And, it was, I, and we'll talk more about this in a second, but, but women were often considered less significant. Some suggest with church history that Mary was even a prostitute. And so there's all these reasons that, that Mary would be potentially seen as somebody who might not be significant in the Easter story. But as we look at this text today, we're going to see that Mary is incredibly significant and her role is incredibly important. And in the same way, you during this, the, even just this next week coming up to Easter, have the ability to, to make an incredible impact in the kingdom of God, no matter who you are, no matter what your story is. And it's not because you could be great, but it's because our Heavenly Father is great. And so I hope that Mary uh, encourages you. And, and I just kind of want to ask you this question is, you know, what's your role look like in this next week as Easter comes up? The most important aspect of, of, of our Christian faith, the, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as Easter comes next Sunday, what's your role look like right now? And so as Chris mentioned, we're in this, this Vantage Point series. And a Vantage Point is, is you know, just this idea that like, 
wherever you see something from, it changes how you experience it. And I, you know, I think of surfing. I brought my surfer magazine. I don't know if you guys can see it. I Hopefully you can. But I brought my old school surfer magazine. RIP Surfer Magazine is one of the things that died during uh, this 2020 year. But uh, the Surfer Magazine, I can look at waves in the Surfer Magazine from the vantage point of holding it in a magazine. Or if I look at it, waves on my phone or on my TV, I can think I can surf that. I can look at waves often from the beach and think, yeah, I got it, no big deal. And then once you're on your stomach paddling and you have the vantage point of the wave out and up in front of you, it's like, oh boy, that's a whole different picture. Or once you're paddling and you're about to drop in and the bottom's kind of falling out of the wave and you're going, oh boy, that's a different vantage point. Each person that, that encountered the cross uh, and encountered Jesus during that Easter Holy Week, they have a different vantage point. They have a different angle. They have a different experience. And so today we're, gonna, we're diving into the experience of, of Mary, and we're also just going to kind of encompass the, the other women. And, and you'll see it in the text because they kind of just clump them together. And it's part of that, uh, that, that problem with the ancient history here. But, but with Mary and the women that are at the cross and the vantage point that they have, and something that's so cool is they have such a unique and full picture that's beyond what the others experience. And so that's where we're at this morning. And what I want to do is I want to give you just four ways that the insignificant vantage point, insignificant, they are actually very significant people, the insignificant vantage point of Mary and the women and why they're actually so important. And so we'll be uh, looking in Mark chapters 14 15 and 16. So hopefully you can open up in the text and get ready for that. But before I get into it, I just have to explain a little more about the historical context of, of what it was like for these women. Uh, women in, in this era, they were often seen as like second class citizens. Uh, they were largely confined to their father's homes, either that or to their husband's home. So they would have that transition. And, and that was, that's part of like when you go to a wedding and there's that handoff. It doesn't seem as beautiful now, but I still really look forward to handing off my daughter one day. Um, but but that, that's, they were always, a woman was always under a man somewhere, whether it was her father or whether it was her husband. Women, often their testimonies would not be taken seriously or taken into account. Um, beyond all of that, they, they, they really didn't have the ability to kind of make faith choices or, or just move about freely. They would do what their families did. They would believe what their families believed. And so I share these things because as we look at this text and as we encounter these women who follow Jesus, we realize a couple of things that are just really important. The first one is that Jesus was radically progressive in how he valued and empowered women. The same way that there was 12 disciples, uh, men who followed Jesus, there were these groups of women who chose to follow Jesus. And they followed him from Galilee all the way to the cross. And Jesus allowed them to do that. He empowered them to do that. The second reason that this is so important is because there's just this, this, this incredible value to us having this in the scriptures because what we know from the ancient world is that, that a woman's testimony would not, have been, uh, would not have been considered valid. And so if you were going to make up uh, a story about a resurrection of Jesus, you would not want to use women as your primary, um, as your primary evidence. You would not want to use them as the sole uh, uh, viewers of, of the experience. And so what we're going to see is, is in this story, the testimony of Mary Magdalene and the testimony of the women in these events of the cross and the Easter story are, are some of the most important and so we look now, and this is actually helps us. Then it would have been to their detriment because they would have said, no, the woman's testimony is invalid. But what it does for us today, it actually tells us how reliable script, the scriptures are. Because if you were going to make, if Mark was going to make this up, he wouldn't put Mary Magdalene in the position that we're going to see her in today. He'd put Peter or John or some, Luke, somebody else, anybody but a woman who had been possessed by demons and is thought to have been a prostitute. That's not the person you want, but, but the scriptures, they tell it how it was. And so what was possibly to their detriment with the testimonies in that day, now in our day, actually helps us in saying, look at how reliable the scriptures are to truly uh, give us how it happened. And so that's where we're at. Mark chapter 14, 15, and 16. We'll start in chapter 
uh, 15 at verse 40. And like I mentioned, I want to give you four ways that the insignificant vantage point of Mary and the women, uh, how, how they were actually so significant. So check this out. First one is this. Um, i got to turn my notes here. Here we go. Hang in there with me, Church Online. Mary and the women support, supported Jesus from Gal- Galilee to the empty tomb and beyond. Let me read these verses to you. Mark chapter 15. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and the younger and, and Joseph of Evs and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women had came up with him from to Jerusalem, were also there. So as we pick up that story, what's happening in the story is that, that Jesus has just been um, crucified. Jesus has just been taken to the cross. He's been tortured. He's been killed. And largely, the disciples are missing. We know that John was there, but largely the disciples have scattered and fled. But the lone group that's traveled with him all the way there are these this group of women. It's Mary Magdalene and the other Marys. And just something to just to know is that Mary was like by far the most uh, common name in that day. And so it's actually very confusing to try to get through the Gospels and try to figure out which Mary is which. And we're going to reference this a few times that we often don't know and can't fully figure it out with certainty. But in that moment, when Jesus is dying on the cross, it's the women who are there. And something that's so powerful about these women, and the clue that we get from this text is right after Jesus has died, it says that in Galilee, these women had followed him. Galilee was where Jesus' ministry had started. And so we have these pictures of this, this group of women who at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, for Mary Magdalene, she's rescued with the, the seven demons, right? But, but then they begin to follow Jesus in Galilee. And they support him along the way. In fact, I want to read to you guys this, um, in this book, Gospel Patrons. A friend has been encouraging me, encouraging me to read it. And Mary is considered to be one of the first gospel patrons. It says this. It says, a gospel patron, to give you a definition of what a gospel patron is, is someone who is invested and involved in another person's ministry to proclaim, to proclaim the gospel. And Mary was a gospel patron for Jesus. Not only did she, not only did she follow him, from Galilee all the way to the cross. But it's thought that Mary and the other women were actually supporting him. I want to read you pages uh, from page 28 to, to the second half of page 29 here in this book. It says, biblical patrons. Yes, but it is gospel patrons, even biblical, you ask. Good question. Allow me to point out a few examples that for, have, that for years have been right under our noses. First, how did Jesus and his disciple fund three years of preaching tours from town to town and village to village after they had all left their jobs? Surely every lunch wasn't a miracle, meal of fishes and loaves. The Bible tells us in Luke 8, 1 through 3, that three generous women named Mary, Joanna, and Susanna came alongside the disciples to provide for their ministry. Soon after, Jesus went through the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him, and also some who had been healed with evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. And so we have this picture. As Jesus goes to the cross, as Jesus travels from Galilee all the way to Jerusalem, as he does ministry for three years, moving through the wilderness and into the city, how is he supported? It's by people like Mary Magdalene. And so this lady that seems so insignificant has this incredibly significant role. What happens in that ministry in those three years if she's not there? The second thing that I want to share with you about Mary and the women is that they gave Jesus the most significant gifts. I'm going to go backwards to to chapter 14. And we have this really cool story as, as, the, uh, as Passover is beginning. And, you know, you have this, the, the Last Supper, and the disciples are gathered together. And there's this beautiful picture of Jesus being anointed in Bethany. And, of course, it's a Mary. And we don't know if it's Mary Magdalene. Some scholars believe it is. Some, some say it's a different Mary. Either way, it says this, Now the Passover feast and the unloved bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some sly way to arrest and kill him. 
while he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume she made, made of pure nard. She broke the jar and the perfume and poured on his head. So those present were saying indignant, indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing for me. The poor, will always, the poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured for perfume on my body beforehand to prepare me for burial. I tell you the truth, that wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, that she has done, what she has done will be told in her memory. And so we have this picture. Jesus has just died on the cross. Mary and the women, they've traveled with him from Galilee. They've supported him. The days before the cross, as they sat together having their final meal together, she takes the alabaster jar in worship and she, and she breaks it, simplifying that it's done. She's going to use the whole thing. It would have been worth more than a year's wages. She pours it on him completely. Others in the room, the men in the room are, are upset. They're frustrated. Why this waste? We could have used it. You know, those who maybe considered themselves significant. And Mary is at the feet of Jesus. And there's this dialogue, but I love, love, love what, what Jesus says in verse 8. And it just popped off the page at me as I was preparing. It said this, she did what she could. This woman who appears, appears to be insignificant to the story, Jesus says she did what she could. I want to challenge us as Easter is, is coming up and we have this Easter week in front of us that we would do exactly what Mary just did, that we would do what we can. Whether that's inviting somebody to Good Friday, whether that's praying for someone to come to the knowledge of knowing Jesus as their Savior, whether that's helping a ministry, whether that's helping for the Easter service, whatever it is that you would do what you could do. Or to go back to the, the, the first point, that you, like Mary, would be a gospel patron. Whether it's your support of your time or your money or whatever, to say that I want the teachings of Jesus to be known. And so I'm going to step forward. And I'm going to do whatever I can do. The third thing, that I want to just point out about Mary and the women, which I just think is so cool, jumping back to that, that story at the cross here, is that Mary and the women had the most complete vantage point of the cross of Christ. And let me read uh, verses, chapter 15, verses 42 through 47. It says, It was the preparation day before the Sabbath. So as the evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate to ask for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus was, had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph brought some linen cloth and took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in the tomb cut out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. So if you think back of everything we've talked about so far, from Mary being at, the, at that last supper and breaking the jar and uh, assuming it's the right Mary, but, and then also from Mary being with Jesus in Galilee and traveling all the way, being there with him when he died. Mary has this complete view that no one else in scriptures has. And, and as I thought about like preparing for this message, I thought about, about like using Peter for the, the vantage point of Peter. And it would have been so cool to use the vantage point of Peter to, to talk about the fact that he has, you know, Peter makes these like crazy bold statements that if all fall away on account of you, Lord, I'll always follow you, right? And, and then you have Peter in the garden and he pulls his sword and he cuts the ear off and there's just all this really cool stuff about Peter, but the reality with Peter is Peter doesn't make it to the cross of Christ. Peter doesn't see the things that Mary sees. Peter doesn't experience the things that Mary experienced. And so I just want us to think about this for a moment because the other 12 disciples, for the most part, weren't there. And so we have this picture that it was, it was, it was Mary and the women who were there 
as Jesus was brutally tortured and crucified. It was Mary who was there when Jesus was taking his final breaths. It was Mary who was there when the guards, uh, when they put the spear into Jesus' side to check to see if he was dead. It was Mary who was there when Jesus' body was taken down off of the cross. It was Mary who was there when Joseph carried Jesus' body to the tomb. It was Mary who was there as Jesus' body went into the tomb and the stone was covered over. This is Mary Magdalene who was there. Now here's the thing. If Mary doesn't follow them, if Joseph doesn't do this act of, of getting, taking Jesus' body, if Mary doesn't follow into the tomb, well then one of the claims that's against Christianity is to say that the tomb wasn't actually empty, was that the disciples actually just went to the wrong tomb. But because Mary was there, because Mary followed all the way to the tomb, when she goes back, which we'll read this in a moment with the Easter Sunday, when she goes back on Easter Sunday and she shows up at the tomb, we know that she showed up to the right tomb because we know that she had already been there with Joseph when they put his body in. Mary and the women, they give us the most complete picture. Their testimony is so significant and important. And so this leads us to the last, my last point that I want to share with you of why this insignificant, these these people that appeared insignificant were so significant. And it's just simply this, that Mary owned the firsts of Christianity. When I first started coaching at Santa Paula High School, the water polo team, uh, we had a blast the first three years going through this process of of establishing the firsts. Who was going to score the first goal? Who was going to make the first steal? Who was going to be the first cardinal to get ejected? When were we going to get our first win? When were we going to win our first championship? When did we have our first winning season? When would we first make it to the playoffs? We counted all of it. We checked all of it. We had a blast going through that. It's Mary, as we're going to read about in just a second, that owns all the first of the Christian story. So in Mary, in, in chapter 16, check this out. Mark 16, it says this. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week. Just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white, a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you'll see him, just as he told you. You think about this for a moment, that, that, that Mary, she was with Jesus through the crucifixion. And Mary is, is, is with him through all those pre-moments. But then it, it's Mary Magdalene and, the, and Mary, the mother of James, who were the first to the tomb on Easter morning. It's them that first see the empty grave. Then when we jump over to verse 9, it says, When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She's the first to see the risen Jesus. She's the first to believe in the risen Jesus. At my, at my last church, they had the, the, it's, it's an ancient tradition that most churches do, but on Easter Sunday, they were all in on the whole, he is risen, and then you go up and then you reply, he is risen indeed. And it was like every single person, you couldn't walk anywhere on Easter morning, it was he is risen, he's risen indeed, he's risen, he's risen indeed. And I, I kind of loved it, like I was all for it. But the reality is, like Mary, she's the first person. She's the first person to say, he is risen. Now the angel got to say it too, by the way. But, but Mary is the first person to say, he is risen. Mary is the person that gets to go back to the disciples who are, who are crushed and crying and gets to rush them and say, no, 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 he's alive. He's risen. This is Mary. Now here's what I, I, I want to I wanna share with you. Is in the same way that last week we looked at Barabbas' vantage point. 
and the way that he and Jesus switched place and Barabbas was given freedom in Jesus. And the way that on Good Friday, Jason will talk about the criminals on either side of the cross and, and the, their vantage points and their two uh, interactions with Jesus on the cross. In the same way, you have a vantage point to the cross and I have a vantage point to the cross. We each have this different experience of the most important and significant moment in, in the history of the world. Of when Jesus has died, gone into the tomb, and rises again. There's aspects of what that means in your life that nobody else understands but you. There are people in your network that you can go talk to and tell he has risen, that they can't hear it from me or from Chris or from Jason or anybody else, but that you can go and tell he has risen. You have aspects of your story that, like, that, that because of what he has done on the cross, not because you're great. In fact, you might be, feel just the opposite. You might feel incredibly insignificant. But because he is great, we have this news to say he has risen. As I've thought about this stuff and been praying about it and then thinking about Mary this week, I'm just, I'm really excited about what God could do through us in these next seven days. If we would take on the kind of attitude that she had, that if we would be gospel patrons, if we would say, this is the best news in the world. And whether it's inviting people to Easter, whether it's funding missionaries, whether it's sharing the, the sermon on my, online, what, whatever it is, I'm going to be a gospel patron. I'm going to make sure this message goes out because I want to be like Mary. Whether it's that attitude where she breaks the alabaster jar and everybody's like, why'd you waste it? And Jesus said she did what she could. To have an attitude this week to say, Easter's seven days away. I'm going to do whatever I can that the good news could be known that I'd recognize that I have a vantage point of the cross, that, that nobody else has. The same way Mary had a vantage point, the same way she saw the whole thing, there's a vantage point that I see that nobody else sees, and I'm going to share that. And this week, and this Easter, I'm going to declare that he's risen because it matters. And this won't just be another Easter that comes and goes, and I show up, or I don't show up, or I watch online, or whatever, but to say, no. If God can use Mary... If God can use a prostitute who was possessed by seven demons in a world that shunned women to be the person that testifies to the risen Jesus, if he can use her in those circumstances, then I know he can use me and he can use you in our circumstances right now. And the world needs this news. We need the vantage point of the cross. Everybody needs the vantage point of the cross in their life. And would we be people like Mary who would go make that happen? Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, would you just encourage us this week? We have a service we can invite people to. We have the best news in the world. We have an example of someone like Mary Lord, would it be the, just the cry of our heart that, that he has risen? Help us to share that with the people that need to hear that. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow. Thanks for that message, Trev. Um, man, he's absolutely right. God can and wants to use all of us, regardless of our background or anything like that, man. Um, that's the vantage point that we want to bring and that we want to be able to see this season in. We're just so thankful that Jesus did all of this, went to the cross, resurrected from the grave so that all of us could have a brand new start. Um, and we look forward to what God's going to do in this upcoming week. Again, we want to invite you to our Good Friday service. It's coming up uh, this Friday. And please, guys, do not miss out on the opportunity to come to Ebell Park on Sunday morning for Easter Sunday in our celebration at 10 o'clock. Again, thanks for joining us uh, once again this week for Catalyst Church Online. Uh, if you need any prayer from us, please use that text to connect um, and let us know how we can be praying for you over the course of this week. And if you uh, are enjoying what you're getting here online and you want to help financially contribute to what God is doing through Catalyst Church, both in person and online, you can always give through the Catalyst Church app. Guys, thank you so much for joining us again once, uh, once again this day. We love you guys. We'll hope to see you soon. God bless.